next to Brian. Sheila, do you want to come sit next to me? Ian, are you happy over there? Um, uh, welcome back, every, everyone. Um, yeah, as Manolo said, uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of conversation and, uh, and a good thing for it. Uh, a larger group of people after lunch than we probably ever had before, and I guess there's a reason for that. Um, when I worked at the BBC, there used to be a tradition years, years ago that the lunchtime news broadcast on radio, which lasted for an hour, in the first half hour they would discuss business and economics, politics and geopolitics, and then when the half hour news bulletin was being read out, a drinks trolley would come in and the presenters could get a gin and tonic or a whiskey for the second half hour where they were going to discuss society, culture, the arts. And I think that what we're trying to do here is something in that spirit. This morning we discussed, now we're going to really talk. And I hope what we're going to really do is talk, unfortunately without the drinks, I'm sorry to tell you, <laughs> about the, the way in which bankers, the wealthy, the powerful are perceived. And there is a method to this madness that those perceptions drive political reactions, policies, the way in which banks and bankers and financial institutions position themselves. And rather than try and get a bunch of agencies to tell institutions what they probably know about themselves, we thought we would get a group of people who really see things differently and, with the exception of you, Sheila, from the inside uh, out, look at things from the outside. So Sheila Baer, many of you will know, of course, part of the Santander family, um, had lived a life uh, running the FDIC, telling banks off when they behaved <laughs> badly, but has also written uh, a bunch of books, particularly for younger people, about financial uh, institutions. Um, uh, Brian Cox has one of the most storied careers, I think, of any British actor, but probably known to most people here for uh, the recent part he played in a show succession. I suspect we'll talk about that, I'm afraid, a little, Brian, in a moment. Uh, Karina Sainz Borgo is, uh, like me, uh, a journalist uh, at the ABC, but also uh, a novelist. And uh, Ian Martin is also a journalist, but has just written a book um, about Fred Goodwin, RBS, and the people who blew up the British economy. So, knows a little bit about the portrayal of banks and bankers. Um, Brian, if I may, I'm going to start with you. Oh. I fear <laughs> that it would... Uh, I feel bad for you because I can't imagine the amount of time that people are asking you about Logan Roy, but, if, but I need to ask you about Logan Roy. Not a banker, but a billionaire. And how much did his wealth affect the way in which you thought about his portrayal? None at all. <laughs> really? No, I didn't really consider his wealth. I just considered his power uh, and who he was. And I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, I think the problem is they don't think about their wealth nearly enough, <laughs> a lot of these people. I think a lot of them could think about their wealth and they don't. And I think Logan very much falls into that category. He is a, he's a doer, you know, it's about doing and it's about shaping. And he's shaped his business, and he's at a certain age. He's actually older than I am. He was a lot older. In fact, he was 10 years older than me. And I, uh, he is about, he wants to find out how he's going to take his firm on. So he looks to his children. Now, when I started the show, the one question I asked Jesse Armstrong, who is the show's creator, I said, does Logan Roy love his children? And he said, absolutely. And I realized that that was his Achilles heel, was the fact that he loved his children. If he didn't love his children, thing would be a lot easier. He wouldn't have any of the problems that he's got. But because he has, and it is a family, you know, this is a, it's a story of a family. And he is hidebound by the fact that he does love his children. So he wants his children to be one of his children to be the successor. There are three of them. There's Shiv, there's uh, Kendall, and there's um, uh, um, the youngest Roman. one, whose name I've forgotten. Yeah. What's he called? Roman. Roman, yes, yeah. Roman, yes. <laughs> but I also forget my own children. <laughs> so I think that was the nature of succession, that one person was always on the outs. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> so that is, that's, that's the bind that he has to deal with and has to deal with these personalities who are damaged in some yeah. way because they feel, even though they are loved, they feel they're in a loveless situation. 
Uh, the female, the mothers are not necessarily present or have been and gone. I think we see them all at the funeral. They all come together at the funeral. And it, it, it's just, I think that Logan is just, he's so bent on his business and how the business is, you know, he, and also the, the most important thing and why he is not Rupert Murdoch. I make that very clear. He is not Rupert Murdoch. Everybody thinks, oh, it's Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch inherited something. No, Logan Roy didn't inherit anything. He started as very, from a very poor background. I, well, let me tell you the story. So when I was approached to do the, the show, uh, and it was a phone call with Adam McKay, or Scots, we would say Mackay, but they say <laughs> Americans. <laughs> McKay, Dan and McKay. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, and um, and Jesse were on the phone to me, and they said uh, they wanted to do this show, and I kind of thought this is a really good show, and it's a very good part. And then I suggested that maybe he could be Scots, he could have a Scottish background, and Jesse was adamant. Oh no, he's got to be American. He's got to be American. He has to be American. Adam McKay, on the other hand, the American, thought that wasn't a bad idea. So we left it. And I was, well, <laughs> I was supposed to be from the United States, but I really questioned Jesse's geography because he had me born in Quebec, <laughs> which as far as I know is Canada and not the United States. <laughs> so <laughs> there I was, born in Quebec, and the first, first episode is my birthday party and he says and he does say born in Quebec Canada okay so the ninth episode of the first series I'm sitting and we're, we're filming in some country house in Herefordshire and it's Shiv's wedding and I'm sitting there it's the ninth episode one only one episode to go and I'm sitting there and uh, Peter Friedman who plays Frank who I keep firing and rehiring firing and rehiring uh, he says, oh, Brian, I've just done an ADR session. Now, ADR is a dubbing session. It's a pro-syncing session. And he said, and they've changed your birthplace. And I went, what? I said, what do you mean they've changed my birthplace? He said, yeah, you're, you're, you're not born in Quebec anymore. <laughs> and I said, so where am I born? He said, oh, I, 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 I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> he said, let me, let me look up. And he said, I'll look up. So he took his face and he went, oh, yeah. And he's just been very American. He said, oh, yeah, somewhere called... Dundee, Scotland. <laughs> and I said, but that's where I was born. <laughs> and and uh, he said, well, that's a coincidence. <laughs> and I said, it's a hell of a fucking coincidence. <laughs> I said, I've been playing this American character for nine episodes, and suddenly they tell me I'm born in Dundee, Scotland. So I go up to Jesse, and I said, what's going on? He said, and this is writers for you. They said, oh, we thought it would be a little surprise. <laughs> I said, it's a hell of a fucking surprise for nine, eight episodes to be a character you thought you were. He said, it's all right. He, he lived in America, so it's, it's fine. But he was born in Dundee. Do, but Brian, one, one thing I'm intrigued by is people were fascinated by Logan Roy as a yeah. persona. And I'm just interested in what they play back to you. Because I'm aware now of the fact that when you walk through an airport or you come here, people will stop and... What, do they, what are they fascinated about in well, the persona of Logan Roy? I mean, I, I find it odd that people want me to literally pay me to tell them to fuck off. <laughs> I can make a fortune out of people to me telling people to fuck off. <laughs> I do a thing called cameo. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> fuck off. And I think, why? Human beings, why do human beings want to be told to be fuck off constantly? Yes. And that, that's the case. Um, and do you think that's about their fascination with just, like, straight power? Well, I think it is to do with the power, but it's also to do with... I think there's something enigmatic about Logan, I hope. I mean, I wanted to create a sense of mystery about him, so you didn't quite know who the man was. And his background, which is never mentioned, apart from one scene we did in the very early episode where he takes a swim and his scars on his back. Mm -hmm. And it's never explained how he got the scars on his back, but you realize that he was abused. It turns out in the backstory he was abused when he went to Canada. He went to Canada as a small child and, you know, and, and he got beaten by his 
uncle it was. But it, so the, the, the thing was that everybody has their own idea of Logan Roy, and it doesn't agree with my idea of Logan Roy at all. They see him in a certain way because he represents authority in a way. Mm. I don't see him, I mean, I can understand that, but I don't think, I think he's probably, of any people I've ever played, he's probably the most misunderstood. So what, just to explain then, how do you understand him? Because he's, all he wants to find, and he's, he's crude, he's rough, but all he wants to do is find a successor within his own family. Now, what's wrong with that, mm. you know? And he wants one of his children to step up to the plate and say, I can take it. Every single child fails. They, they can't do it. His favorite is his daughter. And what he hopes is that perhaps his daughter might take it on. But then it turns out that she, you know, she's difficult, you know. I mean, she, t she can't keep her mouth shut for a start. That's, <laughs> that's one thing that doesn't help. So it was, it's just extraordinary. And, and the way they wrote it, it was a gift. It was an absolute gift. And I would, you know, we did this thing called alt lines because they're essentially comedy writers. So we would have alt lines that people would speak. I said, I don't want any alt lines. I said, I, I really don't. I want to say as little as I can because I want it to be about him observing the room all the time, not about him being... So that's what he's, he's, he, he's looking at the room, how the room is, what everybody's doing. So that he's not that. So he's reacting to the situations around him. H hence that title sequence at the beginning, where we're yeah, seeing it from your eye line. Um, Karina, we, we, we're trying to get a sense of perception overall of wealth, power, bankers in particular. I mean, it's funny in talking about this and in preparing for this conversation, we have really racked our brains trying to find positive, beloved, admired images. It, it, it takes away from film and TV for a minute. Talk through, if you can, a bit on the literature front. What's the general history of bankers in text? Well, I mean, we were talking about this uh, lunch. Um, the thing with money and the bankers has to do with drama. You need conflict. Uh, in literature, you need conflict, you need drama, you need very strong character. And money and power are very powerful for that, are very important for that. And if we, we see, when, uh, let's think about the first story we, we received, the Bible. It's, it's, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man get into the kingdom of the world. Okay. Th than for a rich man to get to the kingdom of heaven. And came up, exactly. And then think about Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice. Shylock again. He, he's a, a kind of tragedy, a drama character, uh, this, this man who owns the money. Then, trying to think about Cervantes, once again. The money exists uh, related to taxes, related to how indeed Cervantes worked as uh, uh, taking, taking taxes. Um, but if you think about 19th century, uh, Balzac, realistic novel, it's the same thing. The human comedy says there's a, there's a, a strong idea of Balzac, uh, says that behind a big uh, fortune, there's a big crime. Uh, is all this the same idea if you travel into the 20th century and you think about Gatsby, the Grand Gatsby Fitzgerald, is the same thing. I don't know why, for literature, the image of power and the image of money uh, makes possible to show conflict. We were talking about family and not in family are novels. Budenbrook is the same thing. The foresight is the same thing. Is this idea of this capitalism, criticizing capitalism, you always criticize a society, a political model. And I think in, 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 for literature, for novels specifically, is very clear. The only good example I could find, uh, trying to think about this conversation in this, uh, this, uh, this panel, is there's uh, Pessoa, one Fernando Pessoa book, is yeah. The Anarchist Banker. And it's a kind of comedy in which a banker and an anarchist try to do business to save the society. But it's a whole comedy. I mean, it's, it's, it's trying to, 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 to work with that and try to play with that. But if we uh, um, analyze very, 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 very near, um, all this financial crisis, subprime crisis, make a, there's a, a lot of representation of money as evil. Yeah. But if, we, if you think, before Lehman Brothers' bankruptcy, there already existed the bonfire of the vanities of Tom Wolf, or it already existed uh, Brett Easton Ellis' American Psycho. Yeah. 
So this idea of GPs, 80s and 90s also provided a kind of very attractive and a spectacular figure of evil money and power, which is kind of fascinating for people sometimes. So, so Sheila, we're on this because we did, we did a run of the sort of Gordon Gecko, the mm. Wolf of Wall Street, all these, all, all these characters that some of you will know well, Margin Call. I, I think the only really heartwarming banker that we came across was Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life. Yes. Um, you, you sat there looking at the work of bankers at the FDIC and you've written about finance and business in books. What's your judgment or explanation for the way in which banks and bankers are portrayed and is there a way of doing it differently? Yeah. Well, I, I think there is. I hope there is. I mean, I think people need to differentiate. I always try to differentiate. Uh, when I wrote a New York Times bestseller, Bull by the Horns, about the great financial crisis and tried very hard to differentiate between the, the vast majority of responsible bankers, those that were FDIC insured, that took deposits, made loans, more of that traditional model, and the investment banking Wall Street community. Most of these subprime mortgages were actually originated by non-banks who then fed them into securitizations that were being underwritten by the investment banks. That's not to say that not all FDIC insured banks were perfect, but the, the bulk of this crisis was being driven in that, in that part of the financial system. But banks generally, because people, you know, then their day-to-day -day interactions, they think more traditionally of banks like a and Deer, and it's like bank, this word bank becomes all-encompassing for the, you know, the misdeeds of what is really a, a, a very uh, distinct segment of the financial services industry, mainly in the investment banking. Even within investment banking, you have better players than others. So I do think Jimmy Stewart was definitely a take deposit, make loans kind of a guy. And uh, you know, Mr. Potter was there too, and he was a bad banker. But I think the vast majority of banks that provide, follow the more legacy traditional model, taking deposits, making loans, do it responsibly, they're regulated responsibly, they're engaged with their communities, they provide value enhancing small business loans, mortgages, car loans, et cetera. Uh, but media doesn't differentiate. And, and I do think that because the bad guys, the bad, the scandalous stories are the ones that have the most you know, uh, media, popular attention, we try to dramatize them, that those are the, those are the characters that uh, end up being uh, profiled. And, and I do think a lot of that is, is, is kind of a, though it purports to damn this kinds of rapacious greed and you know, taking advantage of people and unethical behavior, it also, in a way, glorifies them because too often bad guys come out on top. I think margin call is a prime example where an investment bank that had loaded up on some really toxic securities, knowing they were toxic, unloaded them unwittingly on their customers, you know, and called it a day. And that's how the movie ended. So, you know, and that probably, that may have happened in real life with a certain bank that I won't name. But, but the point is, you don't see the harm that they cause. And Michael Lewis is another example. When he wrote The Big Short about the great financial crisis, he got absolutely right what Wall Street was doing and what these mortgage originators were doing, how, how it drove the world economy into a ditch. What he didn't get right were the people that were hurt. The borrowers, the mortgage borrowers in that book and movie were portrayed, there were two of them. One was a stripper that had six or seven houses she was flipping, and another was a, a slum landlord. They were, I, I saw firsthand, there were millions and millions of people who lost their homes or ended up with totally unaffordable mortgages. Many in black neighborhoods in the US, 10 years later, were still paying off these abusive mortgages because the interest rates were so high, 9 and 10%, but they were underwater, so they couldn't refinance. That kind of human damage is never, that seems like a compelling story to me too, but you never, you never really but, but, never but see But can, can I just ask you, because there, there are two different ways of interpreting that, taking the Michael yep. Lewis stuff. One is that what, what people do, writers, artists, etc., do, is that they caricature they do. bankers. The other view is that bankers caricature humans. That because they're wealth is outsized, because their power is outsized, because as a result their family struggles and squabbles are outsized. They caricature human behaviors and that's what draws writers and artists to them. In Michael Lewis's case, what do you think it is? 
Well, I, I think, I think it's, I don't know him. Uh, my guess is it's the latter, but I do think, and this is probably just human behavior, and we have other authors on the stage here and, and people uh, in the arts, and you do, when you, when you make a close character study uh, and do a lot of research, there may be a little bit of cognitive, cognitive capture there. You kind yeah. of start seeing the world the way they see it. So even though you think you are outing what is really bad behavior, in a way, you're kind of conveying a message of, you know, and even his most recent book, Sam Bankman Fried, I don't want to <laughs> pick yeah. on him, but it, it, that comes through even, even uh, in that kind of a context. I don't know if well, well we, we, we can, I mean, Sam Bankman Fried is a oh, whole panel onto yeah. itself. <laughs> That's yeah, but, sure. but, but Ian, why, will you weigh on this? Because I suppose you've, you've literally just tried to deal with a story of a person, many people here will know the Fred Goodwin story, but for those who don't, yeah. it might be helpful to spell it out. But here was someone who was lionized for years in the British press as one of the sort of titans of British banking, Scottish banking, I guess. And, um, and then absolutely became a pariah, yeah. um, and people called for his knighthood to be stripped and things. So, so, so how do you think his example and your reporting of it, or writing about it, made you understand the perception of bankers? Yeah, well, it was, it, it, it's a while now, actually, since I, since I wrote the book. And I, I mean, I, I, I wrote that book on the collapse of RBS, which many of you will know, it became briefly at precisely the wrong moment, became the biggest bank um, in the world until, um, in, until it effectively went bust and had to be rescued by the UK taxpayer. And the reason that I wrote it was that I thought before the financial crisis, I thought I know a bit about politics, which is generally what I write about and not, uh, not finance. And I thought I knew about economics. But then this thing happened and I just thought I'm completely clueless and sighted on how this disaster could have happened. And I, I used to edit a newspaper in Scotland, The Scotsman, which had been there when the bank had been on the way up. I knew a lot of the characters involved. It seemed somehow implausible to me. So I, I, I set out to try and explain really what had happened and to try and understand it myself, which I think tells you that if someone like me and my trade really didn't understand it, I'm not claiming to have perfect insight into it now, out there, broadly, people have very limited understanding because, mm. because they're busy, they have to comprehend a lot in their lives, a very limited understanding about the distinctions in banking between investment banking and commercial banking, completely different worlds. And it all just gets messed up in one, um, one kind of giant story or, or, or narrative. So I set out really to try and, um, and show this is you know, 10 years ago, that it was more, uh, much more complicated than the sort of popular media perception that there was one villain. Mm -hmm. And everyone could then pour all of their resentments um, and anger about what had happened in the financial crisis, which is justifiable, onto one guy who made tons of mistakes, which are recounted you know, throughout, throughout the book. So I wanted to try and say that a lot of people were to blame the regulators, some of, the, uh, you know, some of the people who did business with the, with the institution, the board, where were the board, where were the sort of straightforward questions. I learned a lot of stuff like, um, which is applicable in just about every area of life. And finance is just life, but bigger on a sort of, you know, bigger plane and it matters so much. The best questions are stupid questions. Yeah. Um, why is that number so big? What happens if that number's not as big as we think it is? What if that goes wrong? Um, people didn't ask those questions because they were bound up in the success of the institution and people want to uh, believe. And ultimately, I think the reason we tell these stories is that they're about, well, human beings like stories and they like drama. A drama has to have a, a villain or villains. Mm. People are interested in the motivations, what drives the villain, what explains it, what explains the sort of crazy world we're, we're living in. I'm not saying I... I got all of the way there with explaining the collapse of a bank, but it wasn't. It was an attempt to try and um, try and also explain. I'm a I'm a pro market person. I believe in banks and, and and markets, and to try and illustrate that, you know, okay, you have these villains, you have the story of margin call, you have Wall Street and all of that. But most, when bankers say to me, well, why aren't there stories about the other side of banking? It's just really difficult. I, I agree, it's just really difficult to construct a compelling 300-page um, narrative or two-hour film about how effective the payment system is. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you know, no, no one says, no one says bad no, drama. <laughs> but, but do you think, bad drama. But, 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 do you think that, but do you think, Ian, that any of this matters? 
could, because as you say, you spend yes. most of your time writing about politics. When there is a, an invasion of Ukraine, a surge in oil prices, knock-on impacts on inflation, you'll have people who say, okay, well, there should be windfall taxes here, different tax rates there. Do you think that the cultural perception of bankers makes a difference? Massive difference. Do you? Massive difference. Um, the way I usually phrase it, uh, and you know, I immersed myself for, se for several years in trying to understand this world and the craziness and the people that, that behave badly, uh, but they are exceptional, I think, and most people, I mean, most of the work of banking, of a commercial bank is lending money to people, trying to get it paid back, that money they use to expand their business, to improve their lives, to create the growth, that growth then creates the, the, the you know, that profit is then dispersed and invested and consumed. And it's a story of, it's one of the greatest human creations, that story of, you know, since, since Adam Smith of the, um, and since the creation of, of, of markets. Um, and I think the, if we unnecessarily demonize, just say, oh, it's all bad, it's all bad. Yeah, right. You end up in a situation where people say, um, you know, well, we can't have profits. Or profits must be taxed into extinction. I always say, well, if you don't, if you don't like profits, wait until you try a world in which there are no profits yeah. and see what's left in terms of social spending and mm. um, you know, money left for investment. Brian, how do you think about this? Because I suppose I get listening to you that when you take on a role, you're, you're thinking about a person, right? overwhelmingly a person. But, but there is a world in which drama is in the business of ideas, is a commentary on the society we live in. And so how, when you're taking on, and I don't just mean Logan Roy, a host of other well, roles, I think, how do you think about that? I think one of the main problems is, and I think this was true in Fred's case, is that you, you kind of fall in love with your own mythology. And it's the mythology of the individual that actually makes you do things in a very bad way because you think you're omnipotent. Nobody's omnipotent. And all bank managers should realize they are not omnipotent. <laughs> they serve. That's what they do. And, they, and when they do it well, they do it brilliantly. Yeah. Or if they do it brilliantly, they can do it well. But the fact is, when you fall in love with that, like we were having a conversation about, at lunch about some guy who was, had been offered 660 million. I can't remember yeah. what the pay figures were. And I kept thinking, and he said, no, I want this. And you thought, this man is in love with his own mythology. Mm -hmm. He believes that he's special, and therefore he should be treated special. Everybody's special. We're all special. You know, and that's, that's, the, that's the danger, I think, that happens. And especially when you're dealing with finance, where you've got to be so circumspect that's what I, that's the one thing that I've been impressed by. And I have to say this in the last day or two is how circumspect Santander is. Mm -hmm. And that's its strength. And not long may it continue to be circumspect. Because once you lose any form of circumspection, you go down a very slippery road. Mm. Very, very slippery road in terms of your own ego. And, and that's what they're consumed by. They believe in their own mythology, and I, I, I think this is a big problem. How, and how much do you think that the, you know, the, the, to extent the conceit of this conversation is misplaced? I'm just looking at you and thinking, you know, you, you, you've just played Bach, right? Hmm. You know, I saw you in Born, you're running a dodgy intelligence operation. You know, I think of Agamemnon, I think of these characters you've played along the way, and to an extent, the fascination is the thing that you're talking about, the psychology of the character. Mm. And actually, the profession of the character perhaps doesn't make any difference at all? It, no, not really. It, 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 it's, it's the human weakness. It's, it's we all share that weakness, that we can be persuaded by something that we've done. Oh, that, that means I figure. And then we fall into a trap. And this is what is happening constantly, not just in the banking world, but it happens everywhere. It happens mm. in the theater. You know, and, and the people who are really contribute are the people who do not fall in love with their own mythology. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're very few and far between, because that's the danger. When you're given success in a way, you can, oh, look at me. I'm mm. cock of the walk now. I can do this. I can do that. Forget it. Just be who you are and think. Mm. Think before you leap.
I don't know. Oh, by the way, if people have questions, thoughts, uh, ideally not necessarily to tell ask Brian to tell them to go away in <laughs> fruitier language than that, but please do just raise your hand and make sure that we get some time for questions and thoughts. There's, there's, there, and I'm going to come back to, to you in a moment. There's a little... Uh, for Brian. I can't. Can you, have you got a mic? Uh, There's a mic, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask Brian uh, if you think Kendall's name was underlined or crossed. <laughs> well, Kendall had potential, but he was an addict for a start. Uh, so that made it difficult, and we had to deal with his addiction before the show starts. So Kendall was already a kind of there was something very flawed about Kendall, and it's, he's, he's a kind of tragic figure, really. Yeah. Uh, and I think he is the. I think he meant he was meant to represent the kind of the dangers of what happens to a family when someone cannot deal with it, as he clearly can't. That's why he would never be the boss, because he's not able. He's not. He can't do it. He was a very. He was very popular, and people felt great empathy and sympathy for him but at the same time in the terms of the business he was a disaster you know and that's why he could not equate the two he could not be present in the way he should have been present so he was always somewhere else and that was brilliantly realized by the writers I think it was difficult also for Jeremy to inhabit that constantly because it was very wearing because he had this sort of a lot of the pain of the piece lay at his feet. Mm. And that's just the way it was. That's what that role was about. And, it was, and he did, I think he did a splendid job. But it did affect him considerably, I think. She, Sheila, can I just ask you one question? And I'm, um, I'm looking around, so please just raise your hand. Can I ask you one question? Um, you, as I said, you're part of the Santander family. You're part of its international board. So you understand, if you like, the kind of European culture around business and success and perception of power and of course yet yeah, you live in the US and you know the US do you think that there is a different cultural perception around success and wealth in particular in the United States versus the way it's portrayed mm -hmm. culturally in Europe I think so yeah I, I think we uh, I think we glorify riches more in the US. I think we, I, and I worry about that, uh, the kind of messages it sends younger people. That's one of the reasons I write kids' books about finance, too, because I do think there is this, uh, um, you know, there's resentment against uh, extreme wealth, but there's also admiration for it. And I think that's built in a bit in some of the cultural messages that young people get. And yeah, I think it's a much worse, I think Europeans have a much more balanced view of wealth than, than they do in the US, I, I absolutely do. Uh, Brian, you live in New York now. A, mm -hmm. you're, you're a Scot who lives in New York now. Yeah. Did you, did, did I, well, you no, I right? agree. I think she's absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. Because I think, I think the difficulty is that uh, America's, apart from 9-11, America's never been invaded. <laughs> it hasn't gone through what we've gone in Europe. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we are, we are forced Actually, it's a terrible thing in many ways, but we, have, we are forced to be more circumspect in who we are and reflect on who we are in that way. In America, they don't... I mean, I was working... I, I was, I'm doing a project, and I was talking to an American actor, and he was saying, oh, it's so simple, you just do that, you do that, you do that, and you solve it, and it's gone, and you go, it doesn't quite work like that. That isn't that easy. It's, it's you know, great sensibility. I can understand your drive and fine, but there are obstacles that you have to negotiate. Now, you don't do, you don't negotiate the obstacles. You bash at them and move on. That's not going to work. And that's, that's the American way. You know, and it's very, it's very hard sometimes. Would you agree? I would, yes. Indeed. Yeah. There's, there's an epic in the idea of success in the United States because the idea of failing is not bad. If you fail and you overcome that, it's even more epic and you become a kind of hero. And it's a perfect character for a book. It's a perfect character for, for, uh, for the wolf of, of Wall Street. Yes. It's that, exactly that. It's a self-made man, of course. He's kind of morally underlying some things, but it's this idea of overcoming, of, of being success, of insist to work. And, and I think it's very different from European narratives. I mean, I'm talking about literature. Uh, and the United States, it's very clear that. 
I think yeah, it's, yeah. Also, it, it's also a, a, a purging process in, in American culture. It's a big part of the American capitalist story. It's such an aggressive, mm. innovative, exciting culture that when something goes wrong, how you deal with it as a society is you find your villain and then everyone attacks, you know, and at the moment it is, um, these people very often may well deserve it, but you pour all of the, con all of the people who have been ripped off on crypto or uh, and other sort of fantastical schemes can look at Sam Bankman Fried and think, well, that's the guy. And it's a great way of you just sort of dealing, can, dealing with that idea, with that trauma, with that, uh, you know, financial trauma and then purging and then moving on. And then in American culture, just do it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I, would, I, would, I agree with all that. I would differentiate between the financial sector and the real economy. I think in the financial sector, um, again, to differentiate between the more traditional banks, I think we should allow banks fail sometimes. They should. It's part of the dynamic process. I think, and this gets back to the margin call issue, we, and there's kind of a Wall Street mentality, but yeah, let's go out, let's be reckless, take, let's take big risk, and then let's figure out how to put it on somebody else when it goes bad. <laughs> I think that is a very toxic culture. I don't think you have that in the real economy the tech sector, other engines of, of, of uh, creativity and, and uh, new innovations. I think it's, it, we have a lot of small businesses that start up and fail all the time, and I agree with you. I think that is fine. We, we celebrate that, you know? Mm. You, you, 10 times wrong, and the next time you get it right, and that's what that spurs our growth and our productivity. Unfortunately, though, I do think there's this kind of toxic attitude in some quarters of Wall Street that it's okay to be reckless so long as you can put it on somebody else. They don't tolerate failure. If you lose money, then that's viewed as a very, very bad thing on Wall Street. <laughs> Alejandra. Thank you. It's great to talk about reputation in a conference like this, such an important topic. I agree the narrative on payments is not very sexy, but is there a potential for narratives on the role of banks, as Anna was describing this morning, in changing people's lives, in helping mm. shape businesses, in helping shape what we believe Europe should be. We were talking this morning about Europe, the vision of Europe. That needs a lot of financing, right? Defense, I mean, all the things we need to do. Um, are there, is there a potential for, poten for positive narratives there? Is there a generational issue maybe also, a second part of the question, between the kind of yeah. people you're describing the, and what we have today as leading banks? Thank the, you. the problem is the baggage. The baggage that's accumulated by the failure of the RBS, the failure of the Lehman Brothers. There's been so much failure, and that baggage has to affect what goes on. So people are naturally suspicious. You know, we've lived, we live in a very suspicious time because we've, we've seen how, how, it's, how it's affected people. And we're going, oh, oh, oh. And we still don't know what to do about it. That's why it's very hard to find how do we, how do we re- how do we revalue what the banking system is? How do we revalue who the bankers are? I think this, I mean, what it's certainly only two days I've been here, but I am particularly impressed by the fact that there's something very rooted about Santander, which um, is not necessarily the same of other banks, where they're more fragile, and they're also meant, led by people who do believe in their own mythology, instead of believing in what they're doing. I mean, I think initially those people who did believe in what they who fall into their own mythology, did believe in what they were doing. But it's so overwhelming that finally you you lose perspective in a way. Mm. But, but can I just ask, just to pick up on Alejandra's question, Karina and Ian, there, there was an argument ten years ago, or in the wake of the global financial crisis, that the bankers really just couldn't say anything because they were they were not going to get a hearing. We're more than a decade on now, and so I think there's a moment, isn't there, for trying to make that case. And I wonder if you make it how. I th well, I, th I think it is it's an organic process that's happening naturally. If you look at the reputational surveys, I think if you look at the data on how people, I'm thinking of the UK particularly, but I'm, I think it applies in other um, parts of Europe, the reputation has started to recover. It's always going to be a long process after the, the shock of 2007, 2008. And politicians mm. and media, journalists, mm. remember my trade, our trade, should never be allowed to be forgotten. We're, we're sort of, in terms of the public, we're probably just below politicians. Think how that feels, just below politicians. <laughs> um, and the, the reputation of banks um, as a sector has, has recovered. So I, 
I wouldn't. I think I would let that process happen naturally. I think it's a health, sort of healthy need, healthy, healthy um, banking system. Um, and I just think reiterating I mean, what I was saying earlier about the importance of profit and growth and innovation. Let these sort of sto let these stories seep in until the next financial crisis. It's true. I I, co I completely agree with that. I mean, I think it's nowadays the perception of media is even worse than bankers yeah. in the moment of the crisis. Uh, thank you, Zuckerberg. Uh, <laughs> that kind of reason. But I remember 10 years ago here in Spain with Indignados movement, uh, Occupy Wall Street, maybe in France a little later, uh, the Yellow Jackets, this feeling of, of anger of trying to, to ask what happened, why this failure, why that, how did we fail economically? It was as well, a way to, to do the same with uh, politics and democracy. Democracy and politics were also uh, criticized as bankers. Even, I think, even more in a more deep process, and it's still, it, it's, it's not solved yet. And I, I completely agree with this. Uh, money has, it's more, it's, better, uh, it's healthier than, than media and, and democracy as well, in people's perception. Um. Uh, I'm, I'm struck, Brian, by what you say about the thought that in the end the way you behave is much more important than what you say about yourself, particularly about narratives uh, in this format. I'm also aware of the fact that we're getting towards the end of the day, and so I'm going to have to wrap this session up. I wanted to say, we, we've never had, I've been to this conference for a fair few years, we've never had a conversation like this about perceptions and things that cross between, as you say, Alejandro, the reputational, but also just the very human. Uh, I hope that people have found it worthwhile and thought-provoking. I've certainly felt lucky to be here. So Ian, Karina, Brian, and Sheila, a big thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. I'm a fan. Um, we're going to make a gear change because we're going to go now into economic resilience and financial growth. I'm hoping that Alicia is here to uh, bring on the next uh, panel. Alfonso Garcia Moria, Mora is here, and I hope Ricardo Mourinho Felix, um, they're all here. So we're going to get up and move slowly so the chairs can move around in just the perfect timing for you to come and take these chairs. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.